Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Book Lounge. Today, we are talking about difficult conversations by Patton Stone and Heen. Your hosts, as always, are myself, Corinne Ritchie. And me, Tom Butler Bowden. And as you know by now, what we do every week on Book Insights is we take a great nonfiction book from past or present and we discuss it uh, with our guests and try to pull out some of the great insights. Um, and as Book Insights curator, I'll give my take as well on why I think the book is still relevant and um, what some of the points you might want to take away with you. Yep, and I will also chime in on the uh, book and as well as give you latest news on the author and the title. Um, so now for the most in-depth knowledge about this book, we recommend two things. One, this podcast is brought to you by Memo, so be sure to check out the savable, shareable 10-point memo about this book. Um, we also recommend that you listen to the Book Insights episode on this book. That's going to be a more detailed summary, overview, and analysis, but here in the book lounge, it's more of just an informal chat about this book of the week. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so the book of the week, Difficult Conversations, came out in 1999, been very influential. Um, it grew out of 15 years work at the Harvard Negotiation Project, and uh, which basically deals with like negotiation, conflict resolution. Some of the authors had been involved in some uh, pretty difficult hotspots around the world. Um, so it's very much a research-based um, book. It's not just sort of pop self-help. Um, and But their, their idea with it was that um, all these sort of difficult times when you have to ask for a raise or fire someone, if you happen to be a boss, end a relationship even, um, or just, you know, address any of the problems of day-to-day -day life, that you do it in a more skillful, meaningful, and um, hopefully empathic way that results in uh, a good outcome for everyone involved. Yeah, and to discuss this important topic with us, we're bringing on a guest who is a professor, and he's the founder of Magna Leadership Solutions. Please welcome uh, Dr. Kevin Gazzara. Karen and uh, Tom, thanks so much for inviting me here. I really appreciate this. Uh, and this is a particularly critical topic uh, that I think is more and more needed in, in industry and in any organization today. So I'm glad to give you some of my insights of how I've used the book, how we've integrated uh, many of the basic topics into our Leading Forward Academy. It's a leadership program that we deliver around the world both virtually and uh, in live. And hopefully I can add some additional insights of how we've expanded the concepts, how we've used the concepts, concepts, what we've seen that works, and some of the challenges that people might have uh, trying to have these difficult conversations. Mm. That's perfect. Thanks so much for being here. Really, really pleased to have you. My pleasure. Yeah, so Kevin, um... Let's we always with our guests, we go back to the beginning and ask them sort of where and how they uh, discovered the book that we're talking about. And at, you know at what point did it sort of come in your in your career and sort of leadership work and so on and and the sort of overall impact it's had on your thinking? Yeah, I think so I had spent uh, eighteen years of my life. Um, uh, before I retired uh, working at Intel. And, you know, my background is I have a kind of an unusual background. My undergrads in a, a dual degree in engineering and business. I went off and did my uh, mass, my MBA, and then I went back to school and, and finished my doctorate in organizational leadership. Um, and as I was going through the program, uh, my, I, I did my doctorate back in 99, right around the same time the book came out. And at the time, I was um, managing Intel's management and leadership development uh, residential programs uh, for the world. And we used to do 2,500 managers and leaders around the world in 10 different countries. And when I retired in 2007 with two of my colleagues to start Magna Leadership Solutions, we had just finished training our 40,000th manager. So we got pretty good at uh, d providing some of the foundational uh, elements of 
of what you have to do to be a really good manager and leader. And one of the things that uh, was a foundation uh, with Intel uh, was two things that you had to um, you had to take courses on uh, uh, meeting management as well as uh, having uh, difficult conversations or having what Intel called constructive confrontation uh, or con sorry constructive conversations uh, and and uh, during in that program in that one of the foundational courses that everyone at Intel had to take within I think the first three months of their time that they talked about dealing with conflict and uh, confronting because Intel was was a very very it was a fantastic place to learn. Um, it was uh, it provided a great foundation for me for for our, our leadership programs that we've been delivering for the last 15 years. Uh, and what we found was that or what Intel found even prior to the book when they brought the uh, the difficult the um, constructive confrontation course into, into play back in the 80s, what they found was that if you had conversations with individuals and you really brought the difficult uh, discussions in early, you could really progress uh, designs and um, and organizations and, and products much, much faster. So, uh, so rather than just kind of yelling and screaming at each other, the idea was is to do it in a, uh, a very respectful way. Mm -hmm. That's great. And yeah, it sounds like you've got a ton of experience in this um, in this field. So for our podcast listeners or viewers on YouTube, if they right off the top just want a quick, easy takeaway, what would you say is like one of the easiest switches that somebody can make uh, during a difficult conversation to take it from, uh, like you said, a confrontation that could be, you know, conflict and high emotions, that kind of thing, to something that's constructive and productive? Is there any small change somebody can make that would help the conversation? should go better um well karen one of the things that we taught was is that you really have to bring empathy to the conversation that you really have to be able to place yourself in the other person's shoes um, and in order to do that you have to be a great listener you have to do effective listening and i think the tip that i would give is when you get into that situation i think the best thing to do is to just shut up and listen and really be intent on the other individual, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then just listen for things that you want to uh, connect with and, th and things that you want to um, not raise the, the uh, pressure of the conversation or the heat of the conversation. What you wanna do is you wanna to listen for opportunities where you can um, not, ne not necessarily divert it, uh, it is to focus it. And the only way you can do that is, is you have to listen and listen for those opportunities. Mm. Mm. Listening. Yeah. That's a great one. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's, it's probably a very generic, generic, um, answer. Uh, I don't think most people do, do a good job listening. Most people sure. listen to respond rather than listen to understand. And one of the things that we teach, we have, we have a whole series of programs that we teach. Uh, one of the uh, programs, all of our programs are called With Purpose. So we have a program called Communicating and Coaching with Purpose. And uh, a lot of the foundational ideas within from this book are in there. Uh, and one of the things that we've recognized through some work that was done by a gentleman by Bill, name of Bill Daniels, and he wrote a great book that we that was one of the foundational books that we used at Intel called Breakthrough Performance. And one of the things that um, Bill kind of talked about uh, was that, you know, people only can take conversations in one of two ways. Uh, they can either take it as an opportunity or as a threat. That, that's it. You know, our brains are, are digital. It's a zero or it's a one. And, and it's your job as the listener in the, um, in the difficult uh, conversation is to, to listen and then respond in such a way so that um, the people recognize uh, that it's an opportunity and not a threat. If you're going to stair step uh, the escalation of, of this um, difficult conversation uh, that's, that's happening, um, uh, you're, you're not gonna be contributing to it. So, so, so listen, 
listen for understanding as opposed to response. Um, and, and the one thing I'll tell you, which is we found very, very useful for the people that we coach and when we do executive coaching in particular, is that um, the way you can tell whether you're listening or not is whether you're formulating an idea uh, or not. And if you're formulating an idea or a response, you're not listening because our brains are serial processors. Our, a lot of people say, well, I'm multitasking and, and our brains really can't multitask. What we found is, is we can do something called time slicing where, where we can bounce back and forth between ideas. We really can't multitask much like a computer can do uh, where we're really running parallel paths. Uh, and and if you're if you're time slicing back and forth, you're really not giving that full attention. So so what we tell people as we're we're teaching kind of our effective listening in particular is is ask yourself or recognize when you're starting to formulate, uh, and that means you're you're not you know intensely listening. The problem here, like in the workplace environment, is that every meeting that you have. Uh, everyone has an agenda. So the boss will have an agenda talking to the employee, the employee will have an agenda about their pay or some other problem. So how do you get around this, this or get, it, get to this point where both sides are actually listening, properly listening, instead of each side having their agenda and just responding to what the other person says and coming back with their own points? Yeah, you know, that, that's a, I think that's a difficult challenge for any organization. I mean, there's lots of uh, different kind of tips and techniques that you can do. I'll share a couple of those um, with you. I think one of the things that we've done, particularly, you know, from my background, uh, from Intel in particular, of running kind of effective meetings and so forth, is to make sure that you, um, uh, that you, that you, one, you have an agenda of the things that you're going to cover, uh, you've given the people uh, specific uh, enough time prior to to coming to that meeting so that they they can process and get some clarity so that they're not processing during the meeting. It's always uh, a great opportunity. And then the, one of the things that, you know, if you read any one of my favorite books, um, I was fortunate to study with Peter Senge at MIT uh, and get certified to do uh, systems thinking. Uh, and if anyone hasn't read the book, The Fifth Discipline, uh, that's another one of my five top books uh, to read, uh, is to read that. And Peter talks about um, uh, kind of suspending assumptions. So if you if you do have a situation where people are coming to a meeting and you really want to, and you really have a very healthy culture, uh, and it's not a, a me, me culture, it's, it's an us or we or a together culture, uh, is to ask them, particularly when you're having a difficult conversation or you're really very, very focused on, on something that's critical is to is ask people to suspend assumptions. And it, it's nice to ask that. Uh, what we have found is, is if you can't get through that block where, where you, what you're talking about is they are coming in and they are coming in with their agenda, they have, they're, they're kind of trying to drive their agenda is one of the things that we've done is um, is we start the meeting off and, and we say, let's let's put all our um, assumptions on the table. You know, if you're doing it live, uh, you can do it on, on a whiteboard. So um, so you want to address the assumptions that people are coming in with their agendas uh, ahead of time. And once you can kind of get that on the table so you know where people are coming from. And, and this is not to argue or uh, with each other, it's, it's really to get everyone on the same playing field, because if you don't do that grounding as you're having the conversation, people uh, are, uh, as you had pointed out, are coming with their own agenda and their own perspectives. So let's get all the perspectives on, on the table, right? You don't have to justify them. Let's just talk about where they're coming from. And, and you can see the, uh, the different camps that people may be in. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. really useful. Go ahead, Karen. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I, I mean, I can definitely see the value of, of starting the conversation, already knowing where everybody's at before, like you said, before trying to justify, before trying to correct, before anything else, just having that awareness, um, I think, yeah, it could, could be really useful. 
Um, so I know one of the themes of this book of difficult conversations is sort of how do you replace conflict with a learning conversation? So it sounds like Kevin, you you sort of start the conversation there. You start with the learning because immediately everybody is on the same page learning, oh, this is where everybody in this you know conversation stands. Um, so I, I love to hear you um, talk about sort of the goal of hearing and understanding um, and rather than being heard, being understood. Um, so how do you sort of balance those where if you're the one that has the like difficult message to deliver, how do you deliver that, but also go in with the goal of hearing and understanding? Well, I, th I think I go back to, you know, the, the one of the main premises of uh, you have to uh, deliver the message in an op as an opportunity and not as a threat. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things uh, that we we teach that ha we found incredibly useful is that um, as you're listening and as you're taking in additional information, uh, you want to feedback the information to people uh, and one of the techniques that we use in our programs is called observation without interpretation and we do i do it this quick little exercise uh with uh, one of the participants in the in the class whether it's virtual or live um that's there that's very cognitive cognitively dissonant where my my words and my body language and facial features are all messed up like where i'm saying something difficult i'm smiling i'm saying something or uh happy I'm, I'm 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 frowning you know everything is monotone and then i asked i asked the individuals uh to give me feedback so like tell me tell me provide me observation without interpretation and what we found was particularly if you can really get the people to listen what we what they will recognize is that most people will provide um uh interpretation rather than observation um so to to kind of get your question so how do you get how do you get through this is that when you realize that you're providing interpretation oh you you look mad or you look disinterested and so forth those are all interpretations and the thing that we know from neuroscience is the minute that i provide you feedback uh in our conversation that's interpretive um you will start processing your response and if I provide it from a perspective of being observational, you will, I can maintain that, uh, that um, connection with you so that we can have a good conversation and I can keep your brain from trying to, to do this time slicing problem that we have. So, so as an example, is you, you might say to me, well, uh, if you just, get, uh, Karen, if you had just said something to me, I might say, if I started with you as like, so, I, I see that you're not interested in this, or I could see that this this isn't something that would be useful to you, right? Th those are all those are all interpretations, and they may very well be uh, something that that's valid. The thing is, is is if I'm interpreting what you're saying and I'm telling you what what that is, it, you're going to go off and and process and, and stop listening to me. Uh, however, if I say to you, hey, Karen, I have three observations. I'd like to provide those to you. Um, um, is that acceptable? Can I provide those three observations to you? Right. So first of all, uh, uh, in, a, in, in having a difficult conversation uh, or, or even just doing really good management and leadership, you always want to give the other person, main, give the other person the ability to maintain the power and control. Right. So that's that's the first thing. So so I'm going to ask permission rather than telling you, like rather than saying, here's my observations. I'm going to ask you, hey, I, I've got three observations. For you, uh, and I'd like like to provide this to you uh, to get your feedback. Is that OK? Right. And so so normally you find out. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So the key is, is to provide the observation and not the interpretation. So what I might say to you is, hey, in that in that in that conversation that we were just happening, what I noticed is when you're talking about this subject, uh, I, your voice got twice as loud. Um, you stood up and you started pointing at me. Now, all those are observations. Now, what I want to interpret is, is, is that's something that you're trying to push on me. You're trying to push your agenda. You're angry at me. And so that's, that's really what my brain is saying. If I start there, 
depending also depending on the culture thing you know we deal with lots and lots of different cultures around you know we're dealing uh we've got a couple of programs running in japan and china and, and europe and the middle east uh the cultures are much much different mm -hmm. so the, the key is is that um is that when i provide you those observations uh now what it gives me the opportunity to do is to ask ask you have you ever had anyone else do that to you like where you stand up and you get louder and you start pointing in your face and, and so forth. Uh, and generally they have had that same experience. And then you can ask them very, very simply, you know, uh, yeah, if you've had that conversation, if you've had that experience, like I just described, or if they haven't, have you ever seen somebody do that? Just ask them, hey, have, uh, how, how do you, I want to really understand how you interpret that. Right. It's okay to ask for their interpretation. It's not okay for you to give your interpretation of that. And typically they'll, most people will be very, very reflective about it. So it's like, well, you know, I would probably interpret that as, you know, somebody being angry or not engaged or maybe even demeaning to me. And, and then you can ask them the simple final question though is like, is, well, should I have interpreted that any differently? And generally, because you're getting this reflective piece to happen, you're getting them to talk through it as opposed, you know, uh, generally there's a great book on verbal judo. And if anybody has read that, if you haven't read that, another fantastic book is that people want to be uh, treated with respect and, and, and dignity, right? So, so the key is, is that if, if you can do that, you can allow the control on the other side. Um, generally, you can, you, can get, you can get through the difficult conversation in a very, very positive way. So it's 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 more like we're solving the problem together rather than, uh, you know, a me, you scenario. Yeah, one of the, I guess, very much related to this um, themes in the book is that we assume difficult conversations are always highly charged and emotional and uh, we, you know, we don't look forward to them. Um, but the the author's idea that um, don't get emotional, express your feelings in a skillful way. And I think this is sort of news to a lot of people um, <laughs> that you can, in, not confusing being emotional with uh, having clear expression of emotions, such mm -hmm. as I feel hurt or I feel angry. You're not actually expressing the feeling, you're expressing <laughs> that you have been feeling it. I mean, it's sort of obvious, but when you're in the midst of a difficult conversation, that's probably the first thing that goes out the window um, and, and you forget about it. But I, I think for me, this in, in this book, it's probably one of the most useful things I came across. You know, um, so one of the things that, that we've done is we've kind of expanded that concept of the the I message right? of 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 feeding that back, you know, so. I guess in a, in a traditional, originally when it was done is, is when you, I feel because, uh, the one, one thing that we've recognized is, first of all, you, you don't wanna make it personal, right? So rather than saying, you know, when you come late to meetings, you know, I feel angry at you, which is, is really not what you wanna say uh, because you don't, you know, care about getting the work done, right? That's a terrible, terrible I message. So what we've done is we've, we've created this uh, approach. So it's when meetings start late. So you're focusing on the event rather than the individual. And then you can add the emotion. I feel concerned. And, and the, the thing that we found is, as we're teaching people to really have these bet, uh, improved conversations is that the emotion has to be about you, not about the other person, as you point. Like if I feel angry, it's dead. It's at you. If I feel concerned, it, it's about me. So you have to make sure people understand <coughs> excuse me that the element of emotion is about your emotion focused internally not outwardly um and then the third piece is is you have to add that meaning it's like when meetings start late i i feel concerned um because we have this new project that we have to get done by the end of the week and this is the only time that we have a chance to talk about it um that's the really the foundation of kind of what they call the the i message what we found is, is that's if you end it there, it always creates or quite often creates a very awkward pause. Like people don't know what to do with that. If I if I was to, to say that to you, 
Uh, so what we've done is we've we've created this acronym called POISE, you know, of being, of being about positive and objective and uh, uh, immediate, um, specific. And then the last one is the E, which is ex explore. We always ask them to say um, uh, at the end of the, uh, the, the I message or the traditional I message is, is to use an, what we call an open-ended request. Uh, so that's the explore piece. So I would say something along the lines of, you know, when meetings start late, you know, I feel concerned because we have to get the project done by the end of the week. And this is the only time to do that. Rather than saying, what do you think? You know, we're asking an open ended question. Quite often, people can easily turn that into a closed ended question where they'll say something like, like, I don't know. What do you think, right? And it kind of gets back and forth. So we we teach rather than using open-ended questions to use what we call open-ended requests. Our brains like the challenge. So rather than saying, what do you think? I, I would say something along the lines of, give me the one thing that we can do that would help, you know, us maintaining our, our schedule uh, for Friday. Uh, if, if, you, if you do that, you know, people, can, of course, could say, I don't know. Uh, our brain says, here's a challenge. I definitely know one thing, and I'm going to throw that in. And generally, that's a catalyst, uh, particularly if it's in a large group. It's a catalyst, and the other people can jump in as well, and it just starts feeding off of each other. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. That's that's really useful. Um, mm -hmm. Another piece that sort of relates to that that the book describes is um, you know, difficult conversations talk about how every difficult conversation is actually three conversations in one. There's what's being said, there's what's being felt, and then the identity of those involved. So just like you were saying, Kevin, about it's not that you were late to the meeting, it's that the meeting starts late and that is, you know, the problem. Um, so I think that kind of helps with you know the what is being felt and the identity of those involved it's not saying you are x y and z because you're making the meeting late um, and it's it's really being um you know aware of their feelings by uh, by sort of framing it in that way so i'd love to hear you know how how does that resonate with you with this idea of difficult conversations being those three things you know what's actually being said what's being felt and the identity of those involved and how to manage all of those yeah I, and I, and i think it's uh, karen it's a very very good point that that those are happening and most people are not are not aware of them some of the foundational pieces that i've mentioned before is uh, allowing the other person to maintain control at all times i think it is the is the first thing the second thing is is that you um you know if you if you've read any of the stephen covey material on seven habits of highly effective people we're always trying to seek first to understand and then to be understood so you want to make sure that that you have a good understanding and that's where the providing the observation without interpretation helps. Um, I, I would say the other uh, the other thing that's that's going to be important to to make sure that you're you're communicating or you're addressing all of the issues is that you want to give the other person uh, kind of the first opportunity to look or be successful. Um, and uh, so let's go back to the example of the meeting starting late. So Joe comes into a meeting Every time he's always 10 minutes late, he disrupts things. That is not the time for me to have the I statement with, with Joe. Uh, one, because it puts Joe in an awkward position, doesn't demonstrate my, my leadership, doesn't allow him to main control, right? And it doesn't give him that, it give him that chance. Um, he's going to look bad in, in front of his colleagues. And if, if I am doing that to him, I'm, I'm breaking one of the, the, you know, the tenets of a good, a good servant leadership a good servant leader. So what I want to do, and this goes back to some of the work that, that Bill Daniels had done, uh, has, has done in his book, Breakthrough Performances, is providing advice and encouragement, you know, uh, uh, to the individual. So what we want to provide Joe is we want to provide him advice. Uh, the number one thing that you have to remember is, is that you want to provide the advice just before it can be used. So if we have this meeting every Monday, Right. Uh, what I want to talk talk to Joe about is talk to him about the importance of starting the meeting uh, on time, and then ask him, giving him control. You know, um, or uh, give me uh, one or two reasons that that you, it might 
that you might not be able to to join us on time because we need your we need your input in order to 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 be successful and you want to do it before the meeting happens not during during the meeting so so that way it, it demonstrates my respect to them uh, it, it gives them the opportunity and by the way you might find something interesting about Joe like we, we did this activity with one client uh, and they were coming one of the people were coming to the meetings late all all, uh, all of the meetings and what we found out was is the individual had to make a decision do I drop my daughter off as a single parent uh, and come late to the meeting or do I leave her there and hoping that she's going to be okay before the door opens and she can get into the school um, and <clears throat> because we hadn't even had that conversation with the individual before we had no idea and our brains do, you know, our brains are designed to fill in all the negative stuff if there isn't enough information. So our brains are, are saying, boy, Joe doesn't care and he's not engaged and he's not committed to, to this. And in, in the meantime, he's really making a great decision of like my my daughter's safety is much is much more important than, you know, that first five minutes which of the meeting, which usually is is not very productive anyway. Mm -hmm. um, Kevin, yeah, we've been. It's been fascinating going to the sort of nitty gritty of conversations and, um, you know, difficult communications, et cetera. I'm just interested though, you work with many companies, some very large ones like Intel and, right. and in other countries. Have you got any examples of how adopting these approaches and techniques have sort of changed the culture of an organization? Yeah. Um... One of the, you know, we, we have something called, you can see in the, if for people that are watching this, right, you can see we have something called our Leading Forward Academy. And what we've done is we've taken our, we've got about a dozen different uh, workshops and programs that we do, and we've put them, integrated them to, together. Um, and we've delivered them in lots and lots of different cultures. We do a lot of work in, in the Middle East, a lot of work in Asia, uh, as well as here. And um, we've just finished a couple of the of the six month programs um, with two very large organizations that are manufacturing organizations, have a lot of people on the floor and they're dealing with uh, hourly workers that are running uh, um, production machines and so forth. One's a chemical company, one's a, a plastics um, manufacturing company. And and what we found is uh, that, that if you can give the people the tools to have that conversation in a constructive, uh, forward-thinking way. That's the other thing that we really we teach them is, is that you want to address the issue currently with the uh, the forward uh, the forward-thinking approaches. Is how can we make this better? As opposed to what most people do is they want to bring in all the baggage from the past. You know, this is the fifth time you've been late, and this is what happened in the past. And 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 you can't uh, if you read any of Marshall's Gold, Goldsmith's work. Um, you know, like what got you here won't get you there. He talks about, you know, don't don't talk about the past, right? Because you can't fix the past. Talk about the present and figure out how to get better in the future. That's what high high performing organizations do. And to answer your question is, is we've seen it. It, it does change the culture. Um, uh, in fact, one of the basic tenets that we have, you know, because we want to get people to take ownership of the conversation is we the we start every single workshop we have with one basic leadership tenant and it's we want you to start from the mindset of i'm the problem or i am contributing to the problem doesn't mean you have to stay there the thing is is if you can maintain that accountability that ownership uh and you know you're going to go into a, converse, a difficult conversation or you are in a difficult conversation we want you to step back and start with the mindset of i'm the problem or i'm um, 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 contributing to the problem. And if you can do that, generally you can get, that's probably one of the biggest elements where people really embrace that, particularly on the manufacturing floor. If they embrace that they're, they're owning this and they, they have to have to change it, even though it's the other person that's yelling and screaming, or it's the other person that's, that's not meeting production schedules or, or, or whatever is, is to start out with yourself of like, you know, uh, what can I do differently? What did I do that I could have done differently? And if you start there, a lot of times you don't even have to have that um, difficult conversation uh, because you may recognize, hmm. And in fact, we just went through this last evening with a with the group in Japan that we're teaching. 
And, and several of them told us the same thing is, is, you know, when I was on the production floor and things weren't happening, I remembered I'm the problem or I'm, or I'm contributing to the problem. And what I recognized is, you know, my directions were not really good enough for, I wanted him to get that production done, but I didn't give him enough specifics to really set him up for success. So, so, so change in culture takes a long time. It's very difficult to do. Uh, the two things I would say that are the most important to, to answer your question. The first thing is, is get everyone on the same page so that they're using the same foundational pieces and the same language. And the second thing that we found, which I think is one of the most critical things is, is that you have to start from the top down. That if you don't get the buy-in uh, and you don't, and people don't see the, the leaders practicing the things that they're, the, the people below them are learning, it's very difficult to change the culture. We've had several organizations that we start with their, their chief, chief executive and his or her staff. Then we take it to the next level and we, and we move it down and, and we see we can get cultural change there. Um, when we go into organizations and the, and the top leaders that hire us, they say, okay, we want you to start with the first line supervisors because they're the problem. Um, uh, we can do that and you can make small incremental changes that might be useful on the factory floor. Uh, you can't make a cultural change. And we tell them that is, it, is if, you, if you have to do some triage, we can start with the supervisors. Uh, if you want to get a cultural change, so it really becomes part of your DNA of your, of your organization, we have to start at the top. Uh, and we've done it both ways. Uh, and we get some, we, we fix some of, we do some of the triage and, and, it, and it helps. The thing is, is it doesn't shift the culture um, because what we're teaching them or what they're learning, what they're practicing of a supervisor on the floor level, uh, all of the managers above them are breaking all the rules. They don't have the same language uh, and they are, um, uh, you know, they're they're really kind of undercutting the uh, and and creating questions for the individuals uh, of like, oh, OK, well, you know, my my boss isn't doing this. So I know we're learning this. Should I really be doing it? Yeah, I love what you said about sort of starting the conversation with the acknowledgement that I am part of the problem. I contribute to the problem. I'm the problem. I think that's a great place to start. And it reminds me of a quote from the book, which says the urge to blame is based on the fear of being blamed. Um, that quote really stood out to me. And, and I think it really um, it dovetails nicely with what you're talking about, because if you're so afraid of taking any blame, then you sort of take that fear and project it onto the person that you're talking to by blaming them, I think what you have recommended is sort of flipping that and not being afraid of being blamed, rather starting the conversation with like, I know that I'm contributing to this and, you know, these are the changes that I'm willing to make. And so you sort of remove that fear. And when that fear of being blamed is gone, then that urge to blame the other person and turn it into a conflict and an argument uh, is gone as well. And I think that's something that's useful, not just in like a, you know, business sense, I think in any type of difficult conversation relationally, um, you know, that that could be really useful. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that one. It's, uh, is, and we and we try to take the blame word out of all of the communications, it, it, you know, blaming people just, um, it, it's just not constructive. Uh, it doesn't get you to the get you to the future. May feel it may feel good. Um, uh, although uh, one thing I want to want to make a point here is that you do indeed have to hold people accountable. I mean, there will be people <clears throat> that are not going to deliver what's expected. There's going to have you're going to have some uh, lower performers, right? Um, so the first thing you want to start out with for yourself is you know, have I set them up for success? Have I given them enough resources? Has my communication be, been specific enough so that, that they know what to do? In general, I'd say 90% of the time, the answer is no. We haven't done that because everything is fast moving. You know, they've done this job for 10 years, so they should, should know what to do. You know, get, them, get the machines done and get the production out by the end of the week. Um, you know, if I'm loading, loading them up with different projects or pulling them into meetings or constantly calling them or asking them to do things that are outside of their job 
you know, what I'm really doing is I'm reducing their resource uh, resource usage. Um, and it's and it's not so much the big things. It's all those little things that that happen. Uh, and if I haven't set them up for success, really, it goes back to really I am I am the problem. Uh, so uh, so blaming the other individuals, uh, no, um, there's really no advantage to 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 do that. That that you really need to be much more uh, introspective and reflective. Mm. Um. Kevin, um, every episode, uh, we ask the guests to give the book a rating out of five and say why. And we also chime in ourselves. Um, Corinne, what's your overall take on difficult conversations? Yeah, so I, I give this book four out of five bookmarks. Um, you know, what I like about this book is that I could really hand it to anyone and it would be useful um, in a business sense, in a relational sense. I think it's applicable anytime you have to have a conversation that's hard. This could help. Um, I love that it gives really specific action steps. It explains how and why. Um, the, you can foster, you know, better communications. Uh, the only thing that was missing for me from this one was like the data, the science, the results. Those are the things that I really like to sort of sink into is, you know, give me some numbers. Uh, but other than that, you know, I love, um, I, I love this book and, and I do think it's really relevant and useful. So I would give it four out of five. Uh, what do you think, Kevin? Uh, I might give it a little bit higher. Um, so kind of being a, a scientist myself and an engineer, I always like uh, data. I always like to work with um, uh, instruments or uh, to, to read studies that are empirically based. I think uh, I, I would give it a probably a four and a, four and a half out of five because I think it was it's one of it's what I would call a seminal work, right? So it's a foundational piece. Uh, they didn't get 100% of the types of things uh, that you that sh that could have been in there. Um, they've gotten 90% or 95% of everything that's necessary. I think it's written in such a way, as you've pointed out, it could be given to anyone. Um, and 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 it, it's difficult to have a conversation just in general. Anything that's that's conflicting, people avoid. I mean, we are not uh, our species is not designed to run towards uh, uh, confrontation. So, so this, I think, provides some great foundational tools that are, that are missing. Um, and, you know, it, it certainly helped me in my career. It's helped me uh, as a foundational piece for a lot of the work that I was doing when I was managing Intel's management leadership development programs. Uh, so, yeah, I give it, I give it a four and, four and a half out of five. I'm not sure it's, it's, it's perfect. It certainly is a very, very close. Uh, and I think the other thing that I would like to point out is I don't think that there's anything in the book uh, that there is any empirical evidence that I've seen that is wrong or people are going to be saying, okay, well, I read something else and it says, no, you shouldn't do this. Okay. So I think I think there's uh, that everything that, they, that they've written. Uh, really, I think if you went out and looked for studies, you could find some that would support their conclusions. Mm -hmm. well, I'll be very quick. Um, I give it a four out of five. I think this was the first book I came out well, over 20 years ago now. Uh, first book I, I read on this subject. Um, and I like how it straddles um, relationships, personal relationships and the workplace. Um, so it, we've we've focused on the workplace today, but um, I, I urge you to read it or listen to the book insight um for for all the, the other aspects of life that it covers um <clears throat> that that are highly useful and um yeah it's written well even though it's written by three people <laughs> somehow they <laughs> they worked it out that it flows quite well and, and it's quite a good read that's right and since its release in 1999 this uh, book has been named one of the top 75 pen penguin classics of all time so the publisher uh, recognized it as an all-time classic um, the authors had all been part of the harvard negotiation project when they started to write this this bestseller um, and since then they've written additional books in the same genre including one called thanks for the feedback and another called getting to yes um, today, Douglas Stone is a lecturer on law at Harvard Law School. Bruce Patton is the co-founder and distinguished fellow of the Harvard Negotiation Project. And Sheila Heen is a lecturer on law at Harvard Law School. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> that's great um yes uh i think this is a, this is a book for the ages um the research might um sort of add to it as you say kevin rather than sort of replace what's in the book mm -hmm. um and kevin we'll be adding all your information and your website etc uh to to our show notes so people know where to find you um and um and, and learn about all the sort of important work that you've been doing okay that's right yeah, yeah if, well, if people are listening and thinking how do i work with kevin where do we direct them yeah so would you like me to talk for just the listeners or are you going to put that in the notes um so i'm happy to add a link to uh in the show notes to the best place to reach you is that your website or where where should we direct folks yeah uh, i'd say you can go uh to either uh you can go to www.magnaleadership.com that's that's our website or you can send a direct note to me. I encourage people to just connect with me. I'm, I'm glad to help them. Uh, I promise they'll get no sales pitches from me. I'm really a, a helper uh, to try to help people build or good organizations. So you can send it to Kevin at magnaleadership.com. And I'd be delighted to just give you all the, um, the wisdom that I have uh, to help you get better. And if there's a way that I, that we can be, you know, our organization can be helpful. Great. If not, hopefully you can just use the information I send you. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate you joining us to talk about this. And uh, just we like to remind folks to connect with us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Book Insights Pod. Um, also, we have a new website where you can find all of our episodes, and that is podcast.memo.com. So be sure to check there uh, for all of our show notes, and you can watch or listen to all of our episodes. Um, thank you again, Dr. Kevin Gazzara, for joining us and help folks watching or listening will join us again every Wednesday. We talk about a new life-changing uh, nonfiction book. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kevin. All right. Thank you very much for the invitation. Mm -hmm.